Okay, hello and good morning everyone. So I'm Mike Anderson and uh, today I'm going to be talking about convergent consensus, which is a key thing that we're doing as part of our work at the Convex Foundation. But I want to start by going back to the beginning. So I learned to code on an 8-bit computer. It's an Atari 800XL. Maybe some of you have seen some of these. Um, it had a Motorola 6502 processor, and it was fantastic. There were no threads. You uh, certainly didn't have to worry about any networking. You were in control of the whole universe. It was fantastic. Even the only thing that caused interrupts was that annoying human user. But of course, everything goes wrong. People start inventing multiprocessing, multi-core processors. We see the growth of the internet. Suddenly, you're dealing with concurrent processes everywhere, with distributed systems. You have to deal with locking. You have to be, deal with the consensus. It's complicated. And I certainly never thought I'd be standing up here talking about consensus algorithms. But I was interested in something. When you see this world, the internet that we use, we're still very much in control of our own systems, whether that's our own PC or servers or even server farms that are under the control of a large organization. They're still centralized computers in a way where you are in control of your little part of the universe. So I was interested, well, is it possible to build a decentralized computer? This is a a public computer, an open computer, that everyone can use. And it actually should feel more like part of the internet than a typical traditional computer. So here are the requirements we want to talk about. We want to be able to execute transactions on an open network. We want it to have decentralized consensus. So we do want it to agree. We want it to be consistent and to agree on values. But we want that to be decentralized. There's no single entity or organization that can determine the state of the network or the outcome of transactions. We also want it to be fully programmable. We want it to be Turing complete. We want to be able to execute arbitrary code. Of course, we're running this on the internet. It has to be secure. It has to be fault tolerant. People are going to be malicious. They're going to try and break it. And things are going to go wrong. And of course, we'd like it to be efficient and fast at the end of all of this. Or at least, I'd like it to be faster than my 800XL. So it turns out, and this is a quick aside, there is in fact an incredibly elegant consensus algorithm that I completely fell in love with when I saw it. And it is decentralized, and you only need one function. And let's take the max function. This is a standard maximum value of two numbers. You take the largest of two integers. And if you take a function like this, and you give it to all of the different nodes in your decentralized network, um, so let's say we have six peers, A, B, C, D, E, F, and we give them each a number, one, two, three, four, five, six. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, in each round, what you're going to do is gossip your transaction to some random other peers, uh, share your value, and when you receive a value from someone else, you're just going to put it through the max function, and your new value is going to be the result of, of, of that, that application. And you do this repeatedly over a few rounds, and something magic happens. We converge to the same value. We actually converge very quickly. It's almost like a, you know, a virus spreading exponentially through the network. It just fills up the whole network, and you get to this, this single consensus value. And um, this is what we call a conflict-free replicated data type. And they are really, really nice. The processes can basically they can do their own stuff pretty much independently without coordination. You don't need any messaging. You don't need any locks. Simple random gossip networking is OK. So it doesn't matter if you lose some temporary network connections or you don't talk to everyone. It recovers from these kind of, these kind of temporary failures very well. And it's also secure against tampering. Uh, with one proviso, you have to be able to reject a bad value. Yeah, so if someone puts a million in your system, you have to have a way of knowing that that a million is a bad value, otherwise it's going to mess up your consensus. But as long as you can do that, it's actually, it's actually pretty secure. And it is guaranteed to converge to consensus, at least in the terms of eventual consistency. Um, and this has been well studied, and uh, it's, it's 
what you need in order to make this CRDT work is you need a merge function, and it's got to have three, three properties. It's got to be commutative, so you can swap the order of arguments. It's got to be associative. I, I like to think about this as you can put the brackets wherever you like in your, in your calculation. And it's got to be idempotent. If you merge the same value, you're going to get the same result. And if you have a data type and a merge function that satisfies these conditions, you basically get a mathematical structure called a join semi-lattice. And that's all you need for a CRDT to work. And you can prove this. And you've got all the nice properties as soon as you can do that. So some examples, you could have a, a grow-only counter. So you can have a value that grows according to the maximum of two numbers. You can have a, a set, a set that grows. And here, sets are merged using the set union function. And you can have some more complicated things, like a, a last right wins element set. So where the membership, you can insert or delete elements, and the status of an element is determined by the most recent uh, deletion or in insertion. And people have built some pretty big systems using these CRDTs because they are so nice. This includes things like Redis, distributed databases, distributed hash tables can make good use of this kind of technique. But of course, we want to build a computer. So ideally, we want universal state transitions. We want to be able to have some state of the computer. We want to bring along a block of transactions, instructions, if you like. And we want to run that through some process and get the new global state. And with the right transition function, we can make this Turing complete. We can support any kind of calculations and computations as, as we like. And this, obviously, you can apply repeatedly. So you can, if you have a, a sequence of blocks, you can repeatedly apply the state transition. And the nice thing about this is as long as your state transition function is deterministic, i.e. it's a pure function, there's no randomness, and everyone's going to agree the way that the computation happens, then if you get consensus over orderings, then you're going to get consensus over the final state at the end of those, at the end of those blocks. And everyone will compute the same value. And that's exactly what we want for our decentralized computer. We want consensus over the state of the computer after an agreed set of blocks has been, has been processed. So this is what we're shooting for. Unfortunately, most transactions are not going to be conflict-free. And this basically causes a problem. And let's take an example. Let's say you're running a voting system. So everyone gets a vote. Each person may cast only one vote. And once they've voted, they can't change their vote. That's just fixed, fixed forever. So it's a very simple process, uh, the kind of thing you might implement in a decentralized application. But the problem is the ordering of transactions causes different results. If you're voting for A and B, it matters which vote gets submitted first. Um, if you vote for A first, then that's the final answer, and it's never going to change. And this problem is sometimes also referred as the double spend problem. Because if you think this is academic, it really matters. Yeah? It really matters if you're paying two people whether your money goes to person A or the money goes to person B. And plenty of money has been lost this way. So one solution to getting consensus over an ordering is blockchain. Um, so I won't go too much into the details of how blockchain works. I'm sure many of you have seen some of this, and there's plenty of good material on the web. But briefly, we're going to group a bunch of signed transactions in blocks. Each block is going to have a hash of the data within that block. And the next block is going to contain within its own data a pointer to the previous block. So effectively building a linked list that is connected by these cryptographic hashes. Now, in order for a block to be considered valid, it needs to start with a number of zeros. And that's actually a hard problem, finding a hash that starts with a lot of zeros. The only way you can effectively do it is by computing a lot of hashes. This is the proof of work part of the system. And the only reason anyone's willing to do all of that work is, of course, as a reward. If someone actually does all of these hashes, then they get to be the creator of the next block, and they get a reward in Bitcoin for doing that. And the consensus algorithm is really longest chain wins. Um, so whichever is the longest chain that someone's managed to build is considered the best chain. And consensus is only really maintained by economics. 
It's not that you couldn't produce another chain, but doing so would be unfeasibly expensive because of all of the hashing you'd have to do to create a new longer chain. So the incentive is for anyone who tried to build the next block to build on top of the previous chain. So you get consensus just by weight of economics. Um, now, this is just not a great solution. Uh, one of the problems with this is, of course, you're doing all of this hashing. This is not useful hashing. You're not computing something useful. You're just doing it in order to uh, win the right to create the next block. And of course, that creates incentives to spend a lot of energy and a lot of computing hardware doing hashes. And Bitcoin is now certainly using more electricity than many small uh, companies. So it works, it is decentralized, and it does, it does in some way secure consensus, but it's, it's not a great solution. And there's some other issues. I mean, you can ask, is it really decentralized? Um, well, yes, theoretically, but in practice, because of the amount of hashing infrastructure and hardware you need to compute all these hashes, it actually ends up quite centralized among a few mi large mining pools. Is it secure? Well, yes, again, theoretically, um, but you do have this problem that if someone is temporarily able to get more than 51% of the hashing power, they can potentially rewrite the chain, and they can change the ordering of blocks, and they can execute a double spend attack. And it's certainly not scalable. You couldn't run a, you know, a, a, a real global system on this. You know, it takes about 10 minutes per block on average, um, about seven transactions per second. And because of this 51% risk, you can't simply take one block as a confirmation. You have to wait several blocks until you're at least reasonably sure that that's not going to change. So there must be a better way of, of, of solving this block ordering problem. So let's do a thought experiment. Let's imagine, and this isn't true, but let's imagine that you could see simultaneously what every single peer on the network was thinking, what they thought the, the, the consensus ordering was. Um, so here we've got Alice, Bob, Charlie, Dana, and Elisa. They're all thinking of the same ordering of blocks from B0 to Bn minus one. That's the current consensus. So we've got full visibility of the whole network. So let's imagine what happens if someone wants to add a new block. Well, everyone can see this. So everyone can say, well, I've got no better option for, uh, for the next block, so let's just adopt this block. It might as well. So everyone can copy that block and add it to their own ordering. And then, of course, everyone can see this. So they can say, well, everyone's got the same ordering that's beyond the current consensus. So are we in agreement? Can we propose this as the new consensus? So they all say, yeah, can we propose this? Everyone looks around at each other, says, yes, we're all proposing the same thing. We're in agreement. So let's, let's commit this, and let's move the consensus point to now include the new, the new block. So this confirmation of consensus, when you can see the whole world, is essentially it's a two-phase commit. Yeah? And that's got a long pedigree in uh, decentralized algorithms. I mean, it's used in the practical Byzantine fault tolerance algorithm uh, very effectively. So um, this two-phase commit can, can basically get you to a new consensus point. And it's also fairly fault tolerant. So let's say everyone agrees on a new block. If someone changes their mind and says, actually, I don't like AA, I want BB, well, everyone can see that that is inconsistent with the consensus that they've previously agreed. So either that's a faulty peer or a malicious peer, it doesn't really matter. You can just ignore them. Yeah, they're not playing your game, so um, you just exclude them from your, from your future consideration. Of course, what happens if blocks con conflict? Now, this is, this is the very important point. We've got multiple candidates for what the next block is going to be. So the secret here is to only look at the next position. So what is going to be the proposed block for block N? So we see that we've got AA in two people. And imagine you gave everyone a vote. Uh, and you can give the weighted votes. You can have a stake weighted voting on this. But let's say you have a vote, and AA is the one that has the most votes. Um, you're going to choose that for the next position as the preferred option. That becomes your consideration set. So only people who have put AA in that position are now under consideration. So you reduce the size of the consideration set from everyone to only the people who have proposed AA for the next round. 
You now move on to the next position. So what's, the, what's in the, the next block? Well, you've actually only got one proposal here. So you've only got CC. So again, in this case, simple case, you can say CC is going to be the answer. So we define this as the winning ordering. Yeah, this is the best ordering. And everyone can see that this is the winning ordering because they can all do the same computation. Uh, we've also got a new block, an additional block. So that obviously can't conflict with the winning ordering, but we can just put it after uh, AA and CC. So uh, we can just append any extra miscellaneous blocks that other people have proposed on the end. Now, everyone could do exactly the same computation because they can all see the whole world. So they can all propose AA, CC, and BB. We now get the uh, step of saying, OK, this is now proposed consensus. Everyone's proposing the same thing. Are we all agreement? And we simultaneously say, OK, we commit this. Now, this is really, really nice, because what we're doing in one effective uh, round of consensus, um, we're doing simultaneous sorting and confirmation of blocks. So you could have potentially hundreds or thousands of blocks coming in simultaneously and still confirm them all in one shot. You don't have to wait for previous blocks to be confirmed. You can do it all in parallel. And this is a pretty big win. Um, now, of course, this is an imaginary world. Yeah? We don't actually have a view on the entire network. But what we can do is we can define this thing called a belief. And the belief is a data structure. And we're going to have the most recent orderings from each peer. We're going to put a timestamp on each of those. And we're going to get each peer to sign their ordering as part of this data structure so that we can authenticate it and verify it. And it's effectively a mutable snapshot. And the belief is really the peer's best understanding of the state of the network consensus according to the information it has received so far. That's the way to think about it. And we can now define a merge function. So once we've defined these beliefs as a data structure, there's a natural merge operation. So whenever we merge two beliefs, for each peer in those two beliefs, we just take the most recent of those two orderings according to this timestamp. And they're signed, of course, so it's authenticated. And we can exclude anything invalid. If someone puts in invalid data or a bad signature, we can just kick that out. We then update our own ordering according to the consensus rules, so the peer that's actually doing the merge at the present time. And they can then sign it because they've got their own private key, so they can then update the belief with a signed ordering. Now, they can only do it for themselves. They can't impersonate anyone else, because each peer has their own, their own private keys. But they can sign their own part of the belief and create a new, a new belief through this process. And this is, this is basically the magic. We can now build a CRDT, and this combined algorithm we call uh, convergent proof of stake. So it's really, really simple. Peers share these beliefs with random gossip. They merge the beliefs that they receive through um, the merge function. And then optionally, if they have any new novelty, any new transactions, they can append new blocks to their own ordering. And then they just do it again. They just send out their, new, their, their, their latest belief to other peers, and the CRDT happens. And this creates consensus over ordering as a CRDT. And we get all of those lovely CRDT properties that we, that we want to have. So this is great. There's just one big problem. Now, of course, most of you have probably spotted this. We have a size problem. So let's say you have 1,000 peers on the network, maybe 10 blocks a second, maybe 20k data each block. Um, you know, that would be reasonable expectation of a global scale network. Uh, but you're going to have a lot of history. These orderings are going to be long. You might have, you know, 500 million uh, blocks worth of transactions going back a, f going back a few years. This becomes, this becomes pretty big. And um, each belief might be about 100 petabytes on that scaling. So this is not going to work. This is, this is a lot of gossip to get over the network. It's, just, it's simply not going to scale. So we have to solve this problem. Um, we do it with data structures. So in particular, we build the beliefs as Merkle trees. So a Merkle tree is a, a, a tree where each node contains the hashes 
of its child nodes. So it's a bit like the blockchain, except a blockchain is just a Merkle tree with only one very, very long branch. We just build the whole data structure as a, as a Merkle tree. And it's a pure functional data structure. Um, and this has some really nice properties. It's order one copy, and it's order log n for read and update. So it's very efficient computationally. And the log n isn't so bad because we have a moderate branching factor. So you know, tip maybe an average of five to 10 child nodes at each, at each level. Uh, we, obviously, everything's done with a cryptographic hash, so a nice property of Merkle trees is if you have the hash of the top node, then you can verify the integrity all the way down the entire, entire tree. Um, and it's a perfect fit for content addressable storage. So the key is just the hash of the content of each node, and the value is just the content. And this is a perfect fit for uh, append-only content addressable storage uh, and systems like that, which is, again, very efficient. Now, once we've done this, we can start optimizing beliefs. So say we have our belief data structure. We have a belief, uh, ordering for each peer. Well, we're going to notice that, for example, Alice and Charlie, they've, they're thinking of exactly the same set of blocks, the, the blocks that were previously in consensus up to Bn minus 1. So in our storage and in our data structures, whether it's in memory or on disk, we can just deduplicate. We can say, let's just point at, uh, let's just point at uh, uh, that, that same data structure. Uh, but we can go further than that. Um, if you think of this as a tree and we can partition it in various different ways, um, then in fact, all of the peers are sharing the same beliefs up to Bn minus one. So we can just deduplicate all of that. And this is gonna be already a pretty massive uh, saving in size. And then there's going to be some things in the new data. So AA, for example, is shared. We can just deduplicate that. So we've already made a significant reduction in the size of the data structure. It's still too big. And the problem is this massive long chain of historical data yeah? um, that's uh, going be, to be a problem. But we have a solution for this as well. Because it's all immutable, and because peers have shared a Merkle tree with the hashes, we know that they've already got that data because they've already verified it. We know that they must already have the ordering, otherwise they couldn't have sent us a belief that actually referred to that ordering. So we know they've already got it. In fact, we know they've already got most of it. So all we need to do is transmit and gossip the pieces of this data structure which are novelty. And that might not even, that might only be two, two new blocks. Yeah, AA, for example, they could have already shared. They already know that other peers have been sharing that, so that's not new. BB and CC is new, uh, so that's all that we need to share. And you can identify this through your storage mechanism. You can tag things that you've previously seen, and when you try and look up in the store, if it's already, if it's already there, it's not novelty. If it's new, then it's novelty, so you just transmit that. Um, so we only basically need to gossip the newly observed blocks plus some overhead, the layers of the tree that basically validate the integrity of the Merkle tree, but that's a relatively small proportion of, of the data. Um, so this algorithm, I think, is actually fairly close to optimal. Um, first of all, it's Byzantine fault tolerant, uh, as long as you allow for the sort of typical assumptions that you know, there's only a minority of attackers, like less than a third of the network are faulty or malicious. Um, but it's basically as good as you can get in a, in a truly decentralized network where malicious nodes could potentially join at any time. Um, it confirms transactions in as few as three rounds of gossip, um, which I, I believe is also the theoretical optimum uh, for, for a Byzantine fault tolerant system. Um, and that even allowing for some internet latency, that's probably going to be less than one second. Uh, and remember that this confirmation can be happening on many blocks at once. And peers, because there's no, there's no limitation on peers adding blocks in their own belief, there's zero block delay. They can just add a block whenever they feel like it. You don't have to wait. There's no latency for adding new blocks. Uh, we do the simultaneous sorting and confirmation of many blocks. So we could confirm 1,000 blocks in one second. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a problem. 
And the communication overhead is, is obviously ON in the, in the size of the number of transactions that you're executing, which again is optimal. I mean, that's genuine new novelty to the system, so you're going to have to transmit that at some point. And the belief merge is actually very efficient as well, partly because we've deduplicated the data structures so much already, um, but it's just not computationally very expensive. You can certainly do belief merge in less than a millisecond on, on decent hardware. Uh, so, of course, we actually want to do stuff with this consensus algorithm. So this is the convex virtual machine. Um, so it is effectively taking these blocks of transactions and updating a global state. So each instance of the CVM has a global state. We actually run it single-threaded. Um, now, it could potentially be paralyzed, but it doesn't seem to be necessary. It's already very fast. Uh, we get about a million raw transactions per second locally. We can do about a million transactions per second. And the reason for that is, again, we've got very efficient data structures, so the update of these Merkle trees can be very, can very fast. And um, uh, we also have the advantage of, because it's single-threaded, you don't have any locking, you don't have any, any sort of overhead of, of, that, of that kind of accounting. So it, it, it's, just, it's just a fairly, fairly lean and fast system. The structure of the global state, um, I mean, it's a big data structure. Um, it has globals, so some parameters that sort of affect the whole network that everyone would want to be able to see. It has data about the peers, so peers can identify each other and locate each other when they're gossiping. It has a thing called a schedule, which I won't go into too much detail, but it's basically a way of uh, putting in deferred transactions which get automatically executed at a later date. The most important part by far is the accounts. Uh, and these are numbered accounts uh, with the idea that an account would typically either be a user account owned by a user or an autonomous actor account, which is like an independently running program. Uh, those accounts, say, would have a, a public key, so you can verify transactions that a user sends in for that account. Um, sequence number is just uh, tracking the individual transactions so they don't get out of order. Um, controller is, allows for delegated management of an account. Um, and a very interesting thing is the environment. So in each account, we have effectively a key value store where the user can define arbitrary values against arbitrary symbols uh, within the context of their account. So you basically get a little database with, every, with the account. And in fact, it's a bit more than that. Um, we get very rich data types. Um, so we have all the kind of data types you typically expect. Um, you know, your Booleans, your Longs. If any of you are Clojure users, you might recognize keywords. Uh, and then we have some higher level data types, uh, collections like sets, true mathematical sets, maps, vectors, and some specialized ones. So blobs, if you want to store uh, binary data, or an address, which is just a pointer effectively to an account. Um, and every account effectively can be used as a Lisp machine. Um, so you can have a full interactive REPL experience. It's programmable. Um, some little examples. You can like say, what's my address? Get your own address. You can do computation, numerical computations. You can define values within your own environment. You can update your own environment. Uh, you can do data structure operations. So conj foo for is adding a value to the end of a, end of a vector. Um, it's very similar to closure style syntax. The CVM is actually language agnostic. You could compile anything, any kind of front end language to it. I happen to like closure, so we, we, we implemented convex, convex Lisp first. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a very flexible, high level uh, language based on first cast functions, so full lambda calculus. It's got automatic garbage collection. It has an on-chain compiler, which is quite unique, so you can actually compile programs in the decentralized context if you want to. Um, an example of that would be an actor which is able to generate new actors. So within the context of the decentralized um, uh, smart contract or an actor, you can actually generate new, new instances of, of actors. So self-replicating code is possible. Um, it has functional data structures, so all the data structures are immutable, Merkle trees, persistent data structures, rather similar to Clojure or Scala or Haskell. And we have macros, so it's got a, you know, a, a, simple, a simple macro system somewhat in, inspired by uh, a scheme. 
Um, so let's do a little example just for fun. So we mentioned vote counting. This will be a, a typical code for a, a simple actor. Um, so we're going to define a couple of things first. We're going to define um, who has voted so far. So we can have a set. This is an, an empty set. No one has voted at the present time. Um, a second data structure is a map. We're going to say the, the tally of votes. So we're going to have red, green, and blue, each initially with zero votes. And then we're going to have this, this function, uh, defining a function. And the function, we have this special tag which is callable. Now what this means is this function isn't just a regular function. It's an entry point to this actor. So this is something that people, external users, can call in order to cast their vote. And they're going to provide one parameter, which is the color that they want to vote for. So within the context of this, anyone can call this. This is a callable function. So it's really important to check your preconditions and any rules that you want to enforce first. So if someone gives a color which is not in the valid votes, we want to fail. We want to tell you that's not a valid choice. If they've already voted, so we check whether the caller of the function is a member of the voted set. If they are, again, we want to fail. They've already voted. If they pass those two criteria, in this case, we want to actually, OK, we want to count the vote. So we're going to update the votes. We're going to increment the, uh, the votes for the color that they've selected. And we also want to add them to the voting set so that they can't vote again. So if they call this again, it's going to fail the second, the second time. And finally, we just return a, a return value when it's, when it's all, uh, it's, when it's all su successful. Um, now, everything in a transaction is atomic. So if anything goes wrong at any point, the entire thing gets rolled back to the previous state. So you can never get left in an inconsistent state. Now, it's really nice that we're using those Merkle trees. I said we can do order one copies. Rollbacks are therefore essentially free. We can just go back to a previous copy of the entire, entire state. Even though it's a very big data structure, the copy is, is super cheap, and we can just restore it. And this will be autonomous. So this is not a user account. This will be code running and available for people to call on the network. And you could make it updatable, but you could also make it frozen so that no one can possibly update this code, and it just continue doing its job for all eternity in this, in this way. Um, forever. So the usage from a user account, well, you need to know what you want to call. So let's say the vote counter is an actor which has the account 14547. So we're just going to you know, define that. And then it's just a case of calling it. You just do a call. I want to call that particular actor, and I want to vote for red. And it's going to give me, OK, that was a success. If I then try and vote again, I call the vote counter and vote, try and vote for green, it's going to fail. It's going to tell me I've already voted. I'm wasting my time ever trying to vote again because I'm already in the voted set. Um, but what I can do is, because it is a global state, and it's a true global state, so I can query and I can look at data anywhere in the global state. It's effectively public. Uh, so I can look at the votes data structure within the vote counter, and I can see what the current, the current tally is. And that's, again, effectively free. It's just looking up a value in, the, in, a big, in a big Merkle tree data structure. So it's really, really cheap. We can actually potentially support billions of queries per second, simply because it's so cheap to do lookups in these, kind of, uh, in these kind of structures. Now, there is a little bit of necessary economics in this system. So we do have a protocol-defined digital currency, which you, pay, you can use to pay for transactions, the processing cost of transactions. And you can see it as a utility token. Yeah? It's the right to uh, execute transactions. Now, the intention is this is super, super cheap, but we apply congestion pricing if the network starts to get near to capacity. Now, ideally, we wouldn't have to do this, but there are two very practical reasons why we need a transaction pricing mechanism in this kind of system. Uh, first of all, the peers are actually providing real infrastructure. It's maybe not massive great hashing farms, but they're still providing servers to run the, run the nodes, and they're providing stake on the network. Um, so we do need to give them some reward for that, um, just to make it economically viable. And we also want to make denial of service attacks hard. So if you try and congest the network, transactions are going to get very expensive, and it becomes economically infeasible to maintain a denial of service attack for very long. 
Yeah? You can try it temporarily, but it soon becomes too expensive for you to be able to uh, continue. We also do something quite interesting with memory accounting. So this global state can be very big. It can be certainly be you know, terabyte in, terabytes in size, because it's all uh, you know, paged out to disk. But it is still a shared resource. It is still a, a, global, a global constraint that every peer needs to maintain. So we actually do accounting on memory size. And the accounting is done based on the size of state changes. So if you increase the size of the global state, you have to pay uh, to actually buy that extra memory. But the good thing is, because of this accounting, you can also give refunds if you deallocate memory. So we actually create a really nice economic incentive for people to write memory-efficient code. So in fact, some of those skills you might have learned coding machine code on an Atari 800XL might actually be useful after all. And because we're doing this Merkle tree, it actually turns out it's quite cheap to do this memory accounting, because you can just store the data size alongside the nodes in the Merkle tree. So what are the implications of this whole setup? Well, we, we do get real-time, or at least very near real-time performance for decentralized computing. So if you want to get interactive performance, if you're trying to build a metaverse, if you're trying to build something where you want users to get great responsiveness, this is a great approach. It allows you to build stateful apps without servers. You can put the key elements of your application state on a decentralized network. That's not going to work for everything. I wouldn't recommend it for all applications, but some aspects of state you may want to put on a decentralized system like this. It allows, I think, and I think this is very interesting, it allows for self-sovereign peer-to-peer interactions. So people can interact with each other directly without going through any centralized servers. And it is open, it is inclusive, it's somewhere where everyone can participate on a level playing field. It does allow for these autonomous actors and smart contracts, which you can see as providing essential functionality or keeping track of votes, running shared registries. There's a lot of different potential applications for those. And it could even go so far as building entire virtual organizations, so these decentralized autonomous organizations that effectively run just by smart contracts, and different people can interact with those smart contracts as they choose. And a matter which is extremely close to my heart, this entire setup is extremely energy efficient. There's no wasted energy, um, and it's therefore a good sustainable solution if you want to be able to uh, run this at an uh, internet scale. Um, so that's come pretty much the end of, of what I wanted to uh, cover. Um, I would say that we are an open source project. We're a nonprofit foundation building this technology and would very much welcome collaborators who want to get involved. We uh, can visit our website. We've, we, have a, we have a Discord where a lot of discussions happen, uh, both on the sort of you know the technical and the philosophical side, and of course the code's all available on the, on GitHub if anyone wants to uh, dive in and, and get involved with that. Um, so thank you all for listening. Very happy to take any any questions if we have any time left. So that the, the 1 million transactions per second is about how many transactions you can pump through in memory on a local CVM, yeah? So we probably wouldn't expect you to be able to get that on a full-scale network. The CVM itself can handle that, but you're probably at that scale, you're going to hit bottlenecks on networking, and you're probably also at that scale going to hit bottlenecks on digital signature verification. So it's unlikely we'd be able to get that in a full global network. We're still doing a lot of testing, testing on that. Random access to state queries, uh, that can be billions. Because that is, that is one of those embarrassingly parallel problems. You can have 50 peers with replicas of the global state, and they can each serve read-only queries independently. So you can do read-only transactions effectively at, at web scale. Um, so that, it's only if you want to write and change the global state that you hit the bottleneck. Yeah. Okay, so the, um, a couple of things to break down. Um, I mean, it's not technically a blockchain. The blocks aren't actually linked to each other, so it's not really a chain of blocks. It's more like a, an ordering of blocks. Once you've got the consensus up to a certain point, 
uh, the peers have the track of the global state, and if they confirm new blocks in consensus, they then run the computation to update the global state to catch up with the latest consensus. So that could be a separate process or even a separate machine from the, um, the computation of the consensus itself. So the consensus just gets you the ordering, and then the, the virtual machine is then running the computation to catch up with the consensus state um, to get you your, your latest version of the global state. But that can be done separately. Practically, we do it on the same machine. Um, and because it's probably faster to do it that way than to try and pipe the, uh, um, the transactions to, to, a to a separate machine. It's possible maybe we, you, could, you could scale it. That's actually an implementation choice, though. It doesn't affect the protocol. So how you decide to do your, uh, your computation locally doesn't change how the consensus gets agreed. So you, there's, there's various different options there. But yeah, currently it's a, it's a different thread in the same JVM instance on the, sa on the same machine for that. Yeah, okay, that, that, that makes sense. So I'll take the second one first, actually. Is it cheap to confirm consensus? Yes, that's very cheap. Because the global state is a big Merkle tree, you can, in fact, say the state, the hash of the state, the top hash, you just need to confirm that you've got the same, the same state hash as, 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 as other people in the network, and you can confirm that, that, con that the outcome, at least, of those transactions, everyone has come to the same result. So that's, that's, that's very efficient. Um, the question about uh, the finality probably should have a separate conversation afterwards. Um, and I'm not an academic expert on consensus algorithms. My belief is it is basically as good as other um, Byzantine fault, fault tolerant systems. So effectively, similar to PBFT. It's similar in the sense of a two-phase commit. And the finality, as long as you've got enough good nodes agreeing on consensus, that can never be reversed, because they're never going to change their mind. Yeah? So they're, they're, never going to, uh, they're never going to switch once, once, it's, once, it's, once it's reached a certain threshold. So um, it's, it's final once you've reached that point. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Love to continue the conversation after. <laughs>